Hey, everybody. Hey, I bet you're busy, so I'm going to make this quick. My name is Jesse. I'm an elementary art teacher, so usually what that means is that I push my classroom from room to room on an art cart. So yeah, I'm literally turning cartwheels. I'm also a martial arts instructor, so I'm also doing cartwheels in the dojo. I'm a Comic-Con vendor, a husband, a pet owner, an illustrator, a college night class instructor, a brother, a puppet enthusiast, an uncle, a YouTuber, I guess, uh, a son, and a podcaster, just to name a few. For me, the wheels are always turning. And in a world where more and more is being asked of us, it's enough to make your head spin. If you've felt overwhelmed and lost, well, so have I. And I don't claim to know the answers, but I'm happy to look things up. So join me at cartwheelspodcast.com for the latest episodes of the Turning Cartwheels Podcast. I'd really appreciate it. Hey guys, this is Zigman and Zach Takis, and when you finish it up listening to this great podcast, make sure you head on over and check out Shotgun Wrestling Radio. That's right, we're new to the EMT Podcast Network. Over at Shotgun Wrestling Radio, we give you the latest news in professional wrestling. That's right, we cover WWE, Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling, and more. Want to know what's going on in the events in the Iowa Independent Seed? We cover that too with our pro wrestling calendar. That's right, Zig Ben. Not only do we cover that, but we also have a wide variety of interviews with pro wrestlers, both past and present. All our interviews can be found on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Shotgun Radio and the number one. We hope you'll take the time to give us a listen and remember to give us a like and a follow on Twitter and Facebook at Shotgun Radio and the number one. You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows like the one you're about to enjoy, visit electronicmediacollective.com. And now, our feature presentation. Hey, Jordan, your usual drink tonight? Yes, thank you. So, where's Eric and Ryan? Well, they're on their way. I wanted to listen to your latest podcast, but where can I download the episodes again? You can download all of our episodes at movieguyspodcast.podme.com. You can also find us on every social media platform. Every social media platform? That's awesome. Hey, it looks like your friends are here. Let me get the first round for you guys. Okay, so I have not seen I Am Legend since it came out in theaters. I guess in 2007. I thought it came out in 09, but 07. And um, this is the first time I've seen it since. And there are so many questions that I have that I don't think I'm ever going to get answers for. Eric, how do you feel about I Am Legend here? I feel like it was another zombie movie that um, was just kind of hitting while the iron was hot. I This late... 2000s mid aughts uh, seem to be very popular for that genre, like kind of like this uh, sci-fi horror type of thing. A lot of space duelers too. I think we're coming around around then too. But um, you know, anything's different than the um, the usual schizophrenia ending, which we got a, a lot of in the early 2000s. I think. Right. So where oh, it was me, but it was my alternate self the entire time. And it was the narrator. Yeah. So this part, well. This one, trashy enough, as I'm going to bash on it, had a narrated ending, which um, I, I feel like is a pretty uh, bad rule to break. Uh, Ryan, what, I mean, what do you think about this? You know, I mentioned last episode, I've only, I've not seen the entire thing, and uh, the parts I have seen were in the background while I was doing something else. Um, and I got to say, I was, uh, you know, somewhat surprised. Really? Okay, yeah, because I want to say right off the bat that I was not not entertained. You know, like, I actually was interested, and I didn't fall asleep, I didn't feel bored, which it has to be Will Smith, right? Because if there was anybody else in this role, I don't think I would care, right? I mean, like, this movie lives and dies Will Smith. I think you have to like Will Smith as a screen presence to like this movie. <laughs> That's a very good point, actually. It's like it's like Tom Hanks with Castaway. Castaway doesn't work for you if you don't like Tom Hanks. Or any Tom Cruise movie. God, that's a very good freaking point, guys. Yeah, that is, because I don't know if I... You know, what if this was a Dustin Hoffman role, like last week with Outbreak? You know, like, could he have carried this for me to care enough? Would well, I have just, been intrigued? That's just improper casting for any movie, right? But, again, actors can only do so much, and if a story is bad, 
or if continuity is bad or the editing or whatever the hell is bad, then again, it's not the actor's fault. So this is a remake of a remake of a remake, and I decided to do something interesting that I don't usually do for Movie Guys Podcast, but I decided to read the Cliff Note version of the novel that this is based on, which is called I Am Legend. Have you guys got a chance to read this at all? What, no, the, I never read the it. Original? No, by the way, you have to say it's a remake of a remake of a remake of a book. Yes, of a book. So, I'm not going to just wait to give you guys the spoilers to the end of the episode, but uh, in, pretty much in a nutshell, this movie is really faithful to what I've read in the Cliff Note version. Again, I didn't read the book, I just read the Cliff Note version. Um, this is pretty faithful, but the only difference is when the woman comes into Will Smith's life later in the film, um, he is suspected that she could be a vampire. He doesn't know for sure until she confesses that she's a vampire there to infiltrate and figure out where he lives. And then in the book, they develop a romance together and they and they drive off together at the end of the book. So she and this this woman that comes into this movie in the novel is actually a vampire trying to figure out who he is, what he a dark, does. Dark seeker? Yes. I do have a question. I do have a quick question. Just one? With the book? Yeah, it's just it's a quick question. Well, two, I guess. A question leads into another question. Um, when was the book released? Was it in the mid-50s? 50s, yeah. The mid-50s. Okay. Do you think it's an allegory for communism? I mean, sure. I guess I didn't think about it, uh, if this was for communism or not. I just thought it was a vampire I mean, that was story. at the height of the whole paranoia. I mean, sure, um, right? That's what, that's what a lot of... Invasion of the body snatchers. Yeah. Right? I mean, sure, I guess, yeah, if you want to put that into it, yeah. But when I was reading the Cliff Note version of it, I, I didn't put two and two together. I guess I just wanted to compare. Because we have, we in this movie, we have something that uh, where uh, Will Smith plays uh, Neville. What's his first name? Charles? James? Let's just say, let's just say Will Smith. Robert Neville. Robert Neville. Robert Neville. So he plays, he's a another army scientist. He's a virologist. Two movies in a row. That, but this movie has a certain part where kind of places blame just a little bit on for Will Smith's predicament on the military, or at least the government at large, because they're the ones that sail off the island. It does. So, okay. For the love of God, I'm not going to break this thing scene by scene, so don't worry. But I've... Okay, so, so, so here comes my questions. And the questions that I have is, the beginning of the movie, we get voiceover with... Five title screens. I just want to make that clear. Five title screens. And this woman goes on a newscast station and says that they've done this research, done this research, and pretty much they have found the cure of cancer. So they've cured cancer, right? But yeah. then I had, but then all hell breaks loose. And my wife had to explain it to me when we were watching the movie. I'm like, so why do people turn to vampires? And she explained to me that. And and I'm gonna and I'm gonna murder and twist her world words, but this is what she's telling me something along the lines of that, like like ninety percent of the population died, so we have one million people left, and then out of those million people, they ate other people to survive, and because of them eating other people, they turned into these creatures. That's how she and told me i believe right is that what happens how does this happen not in not in this movie this movie is that there was the first wave where everyone had died and then there was the mutation because the virus had then since mutated and then it was able to then infect um some of those who were uh, affected turned into the dark seekers and then there was a small small the surviving one percent that are just immune to the virus so okay. this is a virus because because the scientist woman found the cure of cancer, but the cure of uh, but but for them curing cancer, killed people. Is that what it's telling us? It that those are the mutated ones. Those are uh, of the people who maybe were kind of on the latter end of that infection to where. Um, oh, I'm trying to figure out what the, I'm trying to look up what this thing was called, the virus. But but it was the measles. They used the measles 
Uh, yeah, they do that. I'm trying to figure out what uh, what they fictionally called it, and uh, I'll get it here. But, but, um, uh, but, it, but it had since mutated, and then it made it to from skin to skin to airborne, just just kind of like all the other movies we've seen before. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to understand this, though, is that, okay, so let's just use this analogy real quick, Eric. So you're telling me that, okay, Eric, you have cancer. I'm sorry, I love you, but, okay, sure. you have cancer, right? So they inject you with this drug. They have cured your cancer, but that does not mean that you turn into these creatures. They have cured your cancer, but you just die from the treatment? Is that what it says? No, that the treatment that you would be injected with um, would not stop. After it was done with the cancer, it then had since mutated into something more destructive than killing. I think that's this is the after part of it, and I might be mixing in with. Um, but th- is there more detail in the in the book? Because this is now I'm going into like uh, reading in the fan fiction parts, and uh, no, there's not there's not a lot of detail in it. Uh, uh, Ryan, did you get anything from my confusion on this? I mean, do you know the life of the, the life cycle of this virus and? How people turn into these vampire zombie ghouls? I, well, it doesn't go into it in the movie. It just gives you the statistics of the people that died. The How I interpreted it was that they created this new... They used a virus. They retro um, redesigned it, retrofitted it to be a, a cure or like a vaccine. And that would attack the cancer cells and cure cancer. So when they started mass using it on a lot of people... It um, mutated or it changed in some way to now it's now it's an even deadlier virus than it was before when it was just the measles and it has such a high mortality rate. Um, And then you either depending on, you know, what sort of system you have, you're either immune to it, you are going to die or you change into these things. Okay, so it's not just this virus. Okay, see now. When I watched the movie here, it was, I thought that they found the cure of cancer, they injected people with this vaccine, but this vaccine itself turned them into these creatures. So right now, what you're talking about is a lot of the virus theory, and that already, not even a part of the movie, not even mentioned, but it's already way more entertaining than this fucking movie. Okay, so we can talk about this all day. <laughs> okay, all right, fine, all right, fine, fair enough. I'm just trying to understand how this plays. So, but Will Smith is a general, he's a lieutenant, or whatever, he's a scientist for the military, he lives in Manhattan, and he's trying to get his family out, and we get this backstory, blah, 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 but he is all alone, it has now been three years since the plague epidemic has happened, and Eric, before we recorded the show, you had a major gripe about how he hunts. So I'm going to give you the floor and how you hate how he hunts his food. I got a, 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 I mean, a lot of gripes, to be honest with you. Well, let's just go with this one right off the bat. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, they had spent this time of, uh, of him trying to hunt this deer and taking his time. He has a dog that is, to my uh, presumption, well-trained because it is looking at its owner, Robert, uh, to for reaction and command. So I would assume, and maybe that you guys would too, that this dog is well-trained, right? That Especially on the hunt, if it's going to join up with the hunt. So certainly this dog wouldn't, you know, maybe run away on its fucking own in the middle of the movie into a uh, dark room. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. He hunts for his food, and he's taking his time to hunt a deer. A deer. That, because animals are not affected by this virus, or at least not airborne in certain... You know, aspects and some are. Takes his time. The deer gets wrestled by a escaped lion from the zoo, right? And he's uh, let down. Oh man, I'm not gonna get a deer. And then we see him driving a goddamn Mustang with no obstacles in the street. Uh, and there's and there's all these, there's deer everywhere. There's deer everywhere. Why you spend all the time with the one? Like there's a herd of them. You have a machine gun. It just what are you doing? Okay, okay. So, so Ryan, what do you think of this opening? From the opening of the film until he goes to nighttime into his house. Do you agree with Ryan? I'm sorry, Ryan, do you agree with Eric uh, that that his hunting method is stupid and this makes no fucking sense to it's drive a honorable, Mustang? Honorable? Too, too honorable to do a drive-by on a deer? The f- <laughs> <laughs> also, this, this magical gun or guns uh, that he has that always are, are conveniently just everywhere he needs them to be at the right fucking moment. 
Ryan, go ahead, answer your question. Well, I mean, I think the opening's very effective, because it's just, like, there's no dialogue. It's just him. uh, I mean, it is weird, it is kind of funny, because you don't normally see, like, car chases in post-apocalyptic movies. So, like, that was interesting from the start. Oh, you mean Um, the Ford ad? The the Ford advertising in the movie? Hey, man, this is... is is uh, this is gonna make a lot of money? You can get some high profile, uh, uh, what's what's it called, tie-ins with it. It's really weird. Um, Post apocalypse, and those cars are clean, boy, real clean. Well, you you take care of it. That's his car, you know. You got you got so few things left, right? The ones that the lady I at think... the end too. I, I'm getting ahead of myself again. All car, all <laughs> all the cars are clean in this movie. Anyone that's driving a car, brand new. Just want to point that out. Well, I mean, if there if if the population is so low, you can get, you can have your dream car, and would you would you not take care of your dream car, Eric? <laughs> I I would. I don't know how you're gonna get the the gas because they don't have those cars filled up on the lot. Uh, but well, again, they did show us how he siphoned gas, though. Sure, and uh, he probably cleaned it as well too. I'm sure in a post apocalypse, you want to keep it clean for the neighbors and uh, everyone else. I, something else to do, I guess. So we would not be Movie Guys podcast at all, and we would not be doing our jobs if we did not point out the big MacGuffin in this movie, the big teaser in this movie. But when he was in Times Square, you both saw the Batman versus Superman poster in the background, right? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it's uh, produ- this movie is produced, uh, I don't think he wrote it, but it's produced by Kiva Goldsman, who uh, wrote the Batman, the Batman Forever and Batman and Robin and um, he did actually write a Batman vs Superman script back in the there early two thousand. Tried to incept it into people's nice. minds. Okay, so okay, so we are okay. No, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me just real quick. So the day to day, we go through his operations. Robert never was just this day to day routine, which I, by the way, I feel is a little off because um, as they're doing this whole uh, kind of uh, showing, not telling, by the way, which is a big flaw that this movie fucking does, they show, they, uh, um, uh, I mean, they, I'm sorry, they tell and rather than show for a lot of things. I don't know anyone in the history of whatever that hangs newspaper clippings on cabinets and refrigerators, no matter what time it is. But here we are, it's, it's there. The other part is uh, if he's doing all these day-to-day, like washing his car, feeding his dog, He's been a busy boy. He's been down there for three years, and he's he has kidnapped a lot a lot of dark seekers. Kidnapped, killed a lot of them, and he's doing a lot of experimenting. And if he's on formula, however, you know, series of three hundred, four hundred something, that means he's doing a, a lot of testing in three years. So where the hell is he getting time for everything else? This is a busy boy. He is a busy boy, and and that's the thing that I. That's where I struggle with this movie is because the movie wants to be one thing, but then it turns out to be something other. And that is more true in the third act than I could say throughout the rest of the movie because what makes this movie really good for me is just Will Smith and the dog, right? But when we get other characters involved, i.e. the leader of the Dark Seekers, that is some fucking trauma film bullshit <laughs> toxic avenger bullshit that we you know, yeah the dog the dog who obeys all of his commands doesn't obey his command runs into this dark alley that goes into this fucking building and boom there's all the dark seekers with this big dramatic moment of oh my god we're gonna see the dark seekers for the first time blah 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 great awesome shit and then all of a sudden he decides to kidnap one of them and one of them decided to be, you know, one of them was a female. And then the leader or the boyfriend, husband or whatever you're, you want to call it for the Dark Seekers, Seekers is like attached to her. And I think the movie is trying to tell us, oh, there's some humanity to these Dark Seekers, but it doesn't, but it doesn't give me that. Well, it doesn't clever give me girls, that. I could tell you that right now because they made a trap for him in the middle of the goddamn street whatever avenue that is, and he, and he parked the car conveniently far enough to where he was able to walk up, and then, how, how did that trap work? How the fuck did that trap work? How how are they genius enough to set that thing up, but the dude can't open a fucking glass door? He's got to bash his way through it. They can set up a trap, a genius to, to, to fool a U.S. Army sci- uh, uh, virologist, scientist, as I was trying to say, and, but they are unable to operate a door. So, okay, what, the so hell's, what the hell's going on here? 
Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second because that's something I wanted to bring up because I was confused. But I want to hear Ryan's input on this. Ryan, did you feel it was... Okay, so I'll just... I'll, I'll make the statement then a question for you, Eric. Ryan. Um, I found it laughable that he would go to a video store and rent movies and he had m- uh, mannequins um, and he would pretend to talk to them and he was trying to have a love affair with one that was in the porn section which I always found it funny because I worked in a movie rental store and the porn section was in a dark corner behind a door in the back, not right in the open for everybody to see. So do you find Will Smith trying to bond with these mannequins, Ryan, ridiculous? Or do you find it somewhat, you know, hey, this is what I would do in a situation if if, if, if I was Will Smith because I'm lonely? What do you feel about this acting? Well, I mean, I think it's kind of dumb uh, in general, but I can understand why, because he's the only... He, he believes he's the only human, because he doesn't see the Night Seekers as humans. Um, he's the only human left on the island, and he hasn't had any contact with anyone for three years. Everyone's dead. So, I mean, that's a way for him to like go through a routine and, and keep your sanity, because you're still saying hello and, and somewhat interacting with, with people. But I when, after... Um, you know, the big dramatic moment, dramatic emotional moment hits and he goes back and, and tells the mannequin in the porn section. I told my friend, I would say, I would try to say hello to you. And he's crying and he says, say hello to me. That was funny. That was fun. Okay, good. Cause I was, I was giggling and I don't know if I was an asshole or not. So <laughs> well, it's, supposed okay. to be, it's supposed to be obviously a breaking point. Right. You know, right. but we, it's gotten so ridiculous at that point because it, it, he's the, again, the dog just kind of appears whenever it wants to at this point. He, Will Smith, is able to jump out of uh, New York buildings five floors up. doesn't fucking matter anymore. They can walk away from that. Um, I, 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 he can shoot a automatic rifle with uh, no ear damage, by the way. Just, I mean, and in mid-stride, too. Just, you know, able to... One and, I have, sometimes. and I have shot automatic rifles in my life, and yeah, no... You have to have some Indoors sort of, too. Yeah, no, yeah. Knowing how to actually shoot a gun nowadays in my life, some of this stuff's like laughable. But, but Eric, going back to your point, okay, so now we're going to get to the big dramatic part because really nothing happens in the movie. We get what he does in a day-to-day life with him and his dog. He kidnaps, well, he doesn't kidnap, but he captures a, f- a female night seeker and he's going to start doing testing on her again because he's already done testing with rats and some rats have died some rats have not done anything and then there's one rat that has been successful so he's going to start doing trials again on another night seeker but of course you know he kidnaps you know the main night seeker's girl so how dare he so this is my question so the movie is literally telling me that these night seekers which are pretty much 28 days later zombies right which came out a few years beforehand, where all they do is rage, they have no concept of thought, stole a mannequin from his video store and created a trap? Or was that his trap? Was that his trap that he said that he forgot, or was that a Night Seeker trap? Did he set it? Oh, that could be his trap, but if that was the case, how the hell did they know well enough? I mean, did they just get lucky? Is that what it is? It doesn't matter because either way, he fell into his own trap, let's just say, and he hung up there for, I'm going to go ahead and say, 12 hours. I, I, I wouldn't be able to last 30 minutes. But Eric, Eric, though, man, but, but I think this is a big, big conversation to have with the movie, though. Because if you noticed in the scene, and Ryan, I don't know if you noticed this, too, because I paused and rewound it to make sure. When he was driving, he saw a mannequin turn its head. And I and I and I fucking IMD beat it, and they said that they use some real people as mannequins to kind of like you know fuck with Will Smith's character. So my question is, this is a big point: is did the Night Seekers literally go to the video store, have that thought process, take a mannequin, and put him there to trap him, or was that mannequin? a Will Smith trap that he forgot. Because if it's either or, that is going to define the movie in my point. No, wasn't that that mannequin had a prior scene, right? He exactly. Exactly. So did he move it? Do the nice I mean Ryan Ryan, what do you think? 
Well, I think it's it's the Dark Seekers took it and God set up the trap. Damn form. it! That's so stupid. Because they're trying to um, get vengeance for the the one that he stole. That's I mean that's what I that's what I got out of it. Said they're they're smart smart cookies, by the way, too. Hey, let God, me ask that's you guys, stupid. Real quick, um, this this house that he moved into that that he locks down. That's his house that he had during the out, uh, before the outbreak. That was his family house. Uh, family house, his army scientist, he has his whole lab is just hooked up and fully operating, right? So he's kind of a do-it-yourself guy, right? Um, I don't understand why, if you have all that stuff locked down so well, that you would still choose to sleep in the bathtub. He doesn't. He, if you're talking about the game, because I was confused about that too, Eric. At the beginning Does of the he movie, he to sleep in there. Like, is it? Well, he did. He did because we, okay, so so because there's this bedroom the movie. scenes with him too, he, and he sleeps exactly. on the couch, I think. So he sleeps everywhere on yeah. the house. That scene broke down as simply as this: he shut down everything. He fell asleep in the. Oh, I'm sorry. He was in the bathtub with Sam the dog. His eyes were open. Flashback to what happened with his family came back he was asleep in his bed so i'm assuming he just stays in the bathtub for a little bit before he decides to go to bed i don't know right. but maybe, that's how that, that's the same played out spot. maybe it's his blankie so since we talked about the flashback here we might as well talk about it in detail here because the movie doesn't do it which i think is the is is a big issue with the movie. I think the movie should have opened up with this flashback from beginning, middle, and end, and then go all the way through, because going back to the flashback kind of takes you out of the movie. But uh, but he's trying to get his wife and his daughter out. They have the puppy, Sam, and he puts his wife and daughter onto uh, a helicopter because they're shutting down Manhattan. They're, they're blowing up the bridges, and they people are becoming infected, and his wife, pretty much his whole family... Uh, gets blown up in a helicopter crash. Is this necessary? Ryan, I'm going to go with you first, since you haven't seen this all the way through, and, and Eric's not a fan. So I'm just curious, Ryan, do you think that this family thing was necessary at all? Um, I mean, I think it would have been just as effective. It was just him and the dog. I mean, because the, the, all the emotional, like, familial, you know, yeah, familial emotions that you get from the flashbacks, you get from just his interactions and when the dog dies... Um, I, I don't necessarily think it, it provides some explanation, uh, a little bit of exposition here and there, but like the butterfly thing comes into play near the end because his daughter's doing looked at it's a butterfly, but I don't know. It just, th that, that part at the, at the end feels just wedged in there so they can have some sort of like full circle moment. So I would say no. I don't. I don't think the flashback structure is necessary. It's just a way for them to try to give more dramatic heft to certain reveals. Okay, Eric, you have said off uh, air and now during air that 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 you're not a fan of this movie at all. Correct. Yeah. Did did it matter to you at all seeing this movie again? The death of the dog, because that's what everybody says. The dog tries to save him. He gets killed by zombie dogs, and then he has to strangle and murder his own dog. Does that do anything for you? Oh well, yeah, of course. It's an emotional scene, and especially because of the connection that that dog has to the rest of his family. That right? I mean, that dog is the token to uh, to what he has left of his family. And now he has to say goodbye to it and kill it in a very dramatic fashion. You're in a lab with uh, just everything around you. you. You couldn't, like, you know, like a, put it down by putting, like, you know, some... Humanely. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, you don't have, like, a, a vial of something where you got to inject and put it down. Like, you know, um, I think there was there's one comment here that says, uh, how are you putting the rats down? How are you putting those uh, those other... Uh, the dark seekers down that maybe if they uh, reacted poorly you know like you have to have an emergency i guess well i guess that would just be a gun huh i guess <laughs> ryan ryan what do you feel about the i think you know what it was a necessary real quick well the necessary part was the burying scene i didn't need to see the burying that yeah. i thought that that yeah, didn't right. add really anything into the into the movie but again a lot of there are a lot of scenes in this movie that they really did not need to happen. I actually agree with you on that one. That bearing scene was stupid. Ryan, what do you feel about the death of the dog? Is this impactful as the movie wants you to feel? Oh yeah, no, it's uh, the death of a dog. I mean, I got, 
I got a little of a clumped, not gonna lie. My wife was bawling her eyes out. We have our own little we have Winston. He's uh he's a Labrador. Um he's not as good as Sam. Uh but you know, we have our own little version of Sam and, and it's it's not hard to place your to project your feelings for your dog onto how he's how he's uh what he's doing with his. So yeah, I mean Okay, so that scene was at least effective because one of the things that I was just blown away with about how fast that virus acts, that dog was attacked probably in movie time, not even an hour, and it's already losing its hair and it's turning. Like, Jesus Christ, that's some hardcore virus shit right there. Well, this is a guy who was reacting uh fucking two seconds after he uh injected the Dark Seeker. There you go. Failed it failed again failed again so then he goes crazy and he decides to ram the dark seekers and of course you know the leader of the dark seekers is there he's ready to get his revenge by eating him i'm assuming and then boom this flash of light and we get new characters we get a female and not her son but you know a little boy what, with shrek yeah, this is what i like to re- this is what i like to refer to as the momentum killer Oh, interesting, Ryan. Go ahead, please. The, I'm, I'm curious uh, the on that. Human ex machina. The the moment where he wakes up from then until the end, it's like 30 minutes or 25 minutes or something, just is dead. Like it, the movie comes to a complete stop because now they have to give you the exposition dump of how like you know how did it spread, how many people died, how many people are left, how did you get here, what are you doing, that sort of thing, and it just kills. All the momentum the movie had built up for, to that point. I guess so, the show and tell rule. It, it it stops showing and starts telling. So then, Ryan, you're saying that you liked the movie for what it was, all the way up to the dog death, and then as soon as we get into this female and this little kid character, you were completely like just shun out, like wow, like completely just not interested. Yeah, it's because it, it, it just everything. So that first. Up until the dog dies, everything seems to be building to that moment. Like you, ha- everything is slowly paced, trying to get to that. Like you have scenes of action, um, but they're not large. They're not large scale. You have a, a two-minute, you know, hide and seek sequence in that building before he jumps out the window, um, and then you don't really have any. I don't. Are there any other action scenes besides that? Uh, besides him mowing down the like tension building moments, you know, just kind of um, yeah. reality world building moments there to let you know that he's uh uh all alone that he's just just trying to and what his goal is what he's doing and like you have the MacGuffin that's pushing the story along trying to find the cure and whatnot but the movie's the movie up until now, that point is I can understand about him just that. coping and living his day but i can understand that that's giving him his purpose you know is is to make this cure because i i'm sure that he is he feels burdened that it uh um, killed his, his wife and, and kid, which, by the way, I felt it was unnecessary. The helicopter seemed unnecessary because um, we didn't need to know how they died. We just need to know that, that they are no longer here. Good point. Um, although, although the dog passing scene is very relevant just because that's, you know, his, his token piece. So maybe you could just show that and then you could just, you know, as them final goodbye, um, even leaving that open for for them to come back, but it's still he presumes them dead, and that's that's really what you need is that this is a broken person, who's very broken and, and feels that everyone is dead until again the uh, random savior comes up, and um, he tells a human being that all human beings are dead, despite their, there's a human being right in front of him. being two right there. In front of him, um, he just doesn't want to believe that there's a, uh, a colony. Um, and that's uh, another part, too, who I'm reading a lot. And then I believe he goes on to describe how people would form a colony and survive. I think the third act completely just just does not honor what the first two acts were doing in this movie. This I've been seeing this a lot recently in this this, this year, but, but 
but it's true though that the third act jumps the shark completely because now we get him talking to uh, the woman and the kid the kid's watching Shrek and he throws eggs and bacon because he was trying to save the bacon god forbid you know and then he just shows her the lab and all this nonsense and then the big action piece at the end is that the leader of the night seekers the dark seekers whatever you want to call it loves um uh, fucking just launches an assault on the house and it's just like oh okay this is not the movie that i thought it was the it, it goes it goes off the rails it goes absolutely crazy at this it's, point it gets a little cartoony a little world war z at this point and he's getting um, bit the fuck up but he doesn't turn right because he's immune so he's he can immune. get bit he can get bit 20 times over it doesn't matter right because this guy's getting bit in the fucking neck like jugular style, and he's fine. Yeah, you just want to go into the to the ending here. By the way, yeah, again, I want to. Assault rifle. This guy can't shoot shit in front of him. He misses every fucking shot. He does. Okay, so we get to the ending. Now, there's two different endings that 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 that, would shoot that Eric and I did not know about. Ryan told us to look up the ending on YouTube. So we'll get into the second ending, the alternate ending, after we get into this ending. But the ending is that they go downstairs. Him, this woman, and this kid go downstairs. Um, and the Night Seekers are down there with them. They put the glass in front of them, and he randomly, my wife says, he randomly has a grenade, and he has a grenade, and he's just like, I know what I have to do. He puts him in a wall, little little gully, a little crawl space thing, and when with the, the leader, yeah, with the cure, and the leader of the Seekers runs, and he runs into him, linebacker style, blows him up, boom, and then, you know, fucking uh, the lady and and the kid uh, go to Vermont uh, to get ice cream and say hi to Bernie Sanders. And in a, the in a brand new dead. board. In a brand new yeah. board car. So that's the ending. So I'm not going to talk about the ending comparing to the, to the second ending. So Ryan this afternoon, we're recording this on the Sunday said, did you guys see the alternate ending? I was like, no, there's no such thing. He, he, he Ryan, you sent uh, Eric and I the, the, the text to check it out. So I checked out the alternate ending. So I told you what the real ending was, but in the alternate ending, Will Smith's character is like, I know what I have to do. And the woman opens up the glass doors and the Night Seekers just stand back. And Will Smith carts the female Night Seeker out and gives the female Night Seeker back to the leader, and the leader doesn't literally say this, but he's like, thanks, cool, see you later, and runs away, and they go to Vermont together. So, I'm going I'm to see if you last, Eric. Ryan, which ending do you like? Because I don't know. They go to Vermont at the end of the original ending? Yeah, they do. No, 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 no. The original ending, they do not go to Vermont. She goes to Vermont. The alternate ending, they do. No, the, okay, so, the, well, the clips I saw on YouTube with the alternate ending, because that's the original ending. They had they, they were forced to change it um, after test screenings. Well, which one do you, you know, like? Which one do you like? I, was, I like the second one better, because I think the, the, the one that comes with the movie is really dumb and doesn't work with what the movie is telling you up to that point. The second one works better, because... It's it humanizes these the monsters like, mm -hmm. and it, it goes because at the end she's at the original ending or the the theatrical ending she says this is his legend because it has to tie in with the movie title but the point of the book title I am Legend is he Neville uh, Will Smith is the boogeyman for these creatures like he is the myth to them he he comes when they're sleeping and takes their people away and so. The, the 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 original ending, the alternate ending, ending whatever you want to call it, actually shows you these aren't these they're still humans. There are still humans in there. You know, they're not just these mindless creatures. They have emotions and thoughts and things like that. Okay, yeah. okay, fine, fine. But then show us that throughout the whole movie instead of showing us just the leader. I, I, I well, see that's that's the twist but like that that's supposed to be the twist at the end like because they're presented to us they do these things here and there like when they set the trap for for will smith and then the part where the 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 one uh, dark seeker after the girl gets stolen 
uh, taken away, he stands out and watches. He makes eye contact with with uh, Will Smith. It's like there are these moments where they show you something, but we're told by Will Smith that they're mindless creatures that they don't think they just do and then at the end we we're shown with this with the original ending that no they actually they actually can think for themselves okay eric what do you feel do you agree with ryan that the alternate ending not the theatrical ending is better what do you think i i i think that to be honest with you that they missed the mark on fucking both because the idiots make this movie what they should have done again um more showing less telling is that you could have made him realize that he was the monster uh, a little bit more in depthly and then give him uh, get re- retreat I guess the or give back the dark seeker I'm trying to find my words here of, of who these people are that give back the dark seeker to the main leader which is again ridiculous thing to say the leader of the dark seekers of the mutants I guess that is now um, and uh, with his revelation that he is the monster and being apologetic gives her back and then realizes that um, these are not mutants these are humans these are still human beings uh, with uh, a, a issue that he has actually been fighting for he's trying to cure these people and said he's hunting these people and I think that you could have done that a lot more instead you got this Big blow him up ending and give him a hero's ending for some fucking reason. Um, or you have the the other one where it's like this kind of this cheesy, like, I don't know, like a cheesy thumbs up type thing as the Terminator falls into the, into the you know, into the molten lava. Like, it just, it's just kind of like, okay, so what was that all for then? Like, it took you three years to, to figure this out? Like, it... It's. It, I guess it works, but I, I just don't understand what a lot of the decision making in in this movie. I, I I really don't. And my last statement before we get our popcorn ratings. So let's just say that the theatrical ending happens, like the alternate ending doesn't exist, right? So he blows up this group of night seekers. How this is New York fucking city. This is man fucking Haddon. How many hundreds of thousands of night seekers are there? You know what I mean? So it's like he didn't do a fucking thing. That's just my opinion. Um, the other thing is, uh, yeah, there's got to be a few of them. Like you, you think, and they all seem to be conveniently uh, just kind of packed in in New York. That's where their their thing is too. I, I, the other, I just don't understand the the make. Like the big problem here with this movie is the the appearance, right? How the Dark Seekers look, like sh- sh- you know, just shattered kind of or uh, shredded clothing kind of they, they grow a little bit they're all have like uh, veins apparent uh i guess their tattoos are still very obvious as we saw in the alternate ending so i, I just don't understand like the, the the character model of this why they chose this virus for some reason it helps with your jawline immensely I, I guess i i guess this virus turns you into this big jawline creature but that anyway ryan let's get into our popcorn ratings I'm curious what you have to say, bud. What is your popcorn rating for I Am Legend? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give it a medium bag. Um, it's okay. It's it's an okay movie. It is entertaining for the most part. The, the It is short. That's something I appreciate. In most movies, most of these big um, the releases are at least two hours, two hours and ten minutes. This is a, a brisk 90 minutes. Gets in, gets out. Will Smith is really good in it. He's Will Smith. There are some stupid things, but, you know, it's Will Smith. His charisma covers for it. Um, yeah. Uh, highly, you know, it, it's it's very entertaining. It's I didn't find it boring until the end, but, uh, yeah, medium bag. And, which is funny, too, because the big ending third act with the battle should be the most entertaining, and us three, I'm assuming, is all going to say that the third act is the weakest part of the movie. That's just yeah, interesting. It's a momentum killer. It's interesting. Yeah. Eric, do I even want to ask, what is your popcorn <sighs> rating for I Am Legend? I'll give it a small bag just because it, it had moments. It really had me going. And I I'm shocked. Was- I'm shocked. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm shocked because you've been saying for a week this movie's dog shit. I thought you'd give this a bag of kernels. I I mean, listen, it takes a lot to give me a, a bag of fucking kernels, but I really feel that this movie, if you were to just change a few fucking different things, one, the character model, and uh, maybe a few of the, the, the bigger plot points, um, maybe just leaving more of a loop. Like, like, there were a lot of flashbacks 
they went back uh, quite often to explain stuff that we kind of already knew uh, because you had paper clippings everywhere or you had uh, recorded. He recorded stuff. He recorded not movies or he already seen all the movies, but he recorded like news stuff of the tragedy which is really weird to 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 watch and he relives all that maybe it's he uses it as an inspiration i i guess but again there's a lot of parts of his day-to-day where i just didn't feel like it was necessary I, the character model of the dark seekers is, is the biggest is a really big problem i think that was that was the one but again it's not will smith's fault i think he did a great job in this movie um i think the character is is flawed and has a lot of continuity issues uh with it as well um the Will Smith, this is around this time, what, 2007, where he started it on his downfall for uh, uh, blockbuster, summer blockbuster movies. Like, he was on a, he, before this, he did, what, Pursuit of Happiness, and then you had other hits like Hitch, I Robot, Bad Boys, Men in Black. Like, these are, you know, coming off a hot streak. Then he did I Am Legend, Hancock, Seven Pounds, Men in Black 3, After Earth. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it Focus. These, these are starting to like kind of just go down a little bit more. He's starting to, to do these different movies. Suicide Squad, I don't know where, what changed here, Will Smith, but your acting certainly didn't, but your choice in movies certainly did. And he's, oh. he's, picking, he's picking the wrong movies to, to be Will Smith in. Um, I think this movie, without him, if anybody else may have been a little bit different, I don't know how it may have been less memorable probably without him. This I think he's the only saving grace kind of in this movie. And just like Ryan said in the beginning, if you appreciate him as an actor, then he's uh, probably the reason why you watched this movie or enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, I myself am with this one a small bag. Um, I think the movie completely flounders as soon as the dog dies. Uh, as soon as the dog dies, end of credits right there. Just cut it. Uh, it would be it would be a short film at that point. Um, the only reason why this movie has any clout is Eric, I 100% agree with you, is because of Will Smith. Um, if this was, like last week, if this was starring Dustin Hoffman, this would not be the same movie. Um, I just wish that this movie would give us better ideas of the Night Seekers, the Dark Seekers, whatever you want to call them, zombie slash vampires. Um, I do remember back in 2007, I was fresh out of film school. Um, no, 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 I was in my junior year of, of, of film school. And I and I saw this in theaters, and then and then my fellow film uh, students were like, "Well, you guys see Omega Man because that's the original." And I watched Omega Man, and they'd called them ghouls that were human, that were speaking human, not uh, speaking human, sorry, speaking normal, um, but they had a tan skin and they ate flesh. So I actually preferred the Omega Man version compared to this version uh, more because then you gave him. Um, an interesting villain to go against than, than, than just these Night Seekers. I think the downfall of this movie, quite honest with you, besides the third act, is the zombie vampire Night Seekers. I think that they're very lackluster and not entertaining at all. And I think it would have been a better version if they would explain them more than what they did. But that's my two cents on that one for that i just i just wow uh i will probably see it again to be honest with you like if it was on tv you know it'd be on the background on tnt because they know drama right so let's let's uh-huh. just, there we go let's bring it back in 90s reference it was fine so uh small bag it's not great but it's it's fine Next week, hopefully, we're bringing something interesting to you guys because all three of us are going to be reviewing a movie that we have never seen before called in uh, in the Tall Grass. It's a Stephen King produced movie on Netflix here. Uh, it came out last year. It is a horror film, so I'm excited to see what we got with this one. I'm assuming it's a Children of the Corn esque, but we'll see what we got going out of that one. So stay tuned to our Twitter page at Movie Guys Pod to definitely get into our schedule to see what's going on with that. But uh, like always, Ryan and Eric, thank you so much for joining me on this discussion here for the I'm Legend, and we'll be back next week for another awesome episode. Have a good night.